The Christian faith brings hope and encouragement to millions of people. But what if it was all based on a lie? What if the whole thing was a fraud? What if the preaching that I'm doing is useless and the preaching that you hear each week is useless and in fact the whole faith that we have is futile? It's rather a challenging thought, but one interestingly, which is it's one that's even put forward as a possibility at least to consider by none other than the Apostle Paul himself. You see, the Christian faith is not just based on some philosophy or some mystical ideas. It's actually based on facts of history. Let's have a look at what the Apostle Paul actually says. This is a passage found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, uh, verse 14. If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. And as if that wasn't clear enough, just a few verses later, in verses 17 to 19 of the same chapter, he makes the following point. He says, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. It's really quite a challenge that the Apostle Paul puts out there. He's confident, no doubt, that Jesus Christ actually rose from the dead. But surely we can look at that and say, well, hang on, that was 2,000 years ago. What about now? Well, we've got pretty impressive scientific understandings. When was the last time that you went to a cemetery and found that there was somebody who had risen from the dead? You won't, you won't find too much of that when you go to the universities and learn about science or indeed history or philosophy or whatever discipline. The whole idea of somebody rising from the dead would be completely rubbished and poo -hoo. So how is it then that millions of people have this faith, have a confidence in Jesus Christ that he rose from the dead when common sense tells us that people don't rise from the dead? Now, we can say we can go to the New Testament. The New Testament tells us a lot about the resurrection, and it certainly does. Uh, there's four biographies of Jesus Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. There's also uh, the book of Acts, written by Luke, that tells us the history of the early Christian church. There's no question that the early Christian church preached the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. But somebody might look at this skeptically and say, well, look, that's a New Testament. Surely that's a biased source. Can we actually take it for real? Well, that's a subject of a different topic, and that's this afternoon. We talk about the Bible and whether we can take it seriously. But what about if we just leave the New Testament aside for now? Are there facts in history that will either support the idea of resurrection or indeed that will say, hey, there's no sense in this at all and we can disprove the resurrection. Now, we can refer to the New Testament as a document that can provide us some useful information. At this stage, we haven't really looked at the idea of its reliability or trustworthiness, but nevertheless, it can still provide some useful historical material that we can use. But are there some facts that are predominantly outside of the New Testament that we can look at that it can either support the idea of resurrection or indeed discount it? Now, this is something which is not lost on critics of Christianity either. Um, there have been many who have looked at this topic seeking to discredit the Christian faith. Um, I think of Frank Morrison, who was a journalist, and he set out to write a book and he wanted to uh, destroy the foundations and the credibility of the Christian faith. So what did he decide to do? He decided to research the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And he wanted to write a book disproving Christianity. What sort of book did he write? Well, we'll have a look at that a little bit later. There's another um, man by the name of Josh. He was a university student at the time. Um, he wanted to also investigate Christianity. Why? Because he wanted to disprove it. In fact, he was challenged by someone at the university, a believer, to investigate the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus for himself to see what conclusion he could come up with. And so he took on that challenge, wanting to discredit the Christian faith. See, he had grown up with the idea that if a Christian had a single brain cell, it would die of loneliness. 
He really didn't have a high opinion of Christians. And so he then set out on this task and he figured that if he could disprove the resurrection as a historical fact, then he would have destroyed Christianity. He didn't make that up himself. The Apostle Paul actually puts that challenge effectively out there by saying, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. The preaching is a waste of time. Well, what are some historical facts that we can have a look at that almost universally every scholar in the world will agree with, whether they're believers or skeptics? Well, there's a few that I want to run through. The first one is that Jesus was a real person of history and he died by crucifixion. I don't think anymore there's um, anyone who's seriously in scholarship who denies that Jesus Christ actually existed. Uh, there are more than 17 sources outside of the New Testament which refer to Jesus Christ as a historical person. And here we have historians such as Tacitus, Josephus, etc., etc. That's not a question. Then there's also the question though, did he die by crucifixion or was there some sort of other method? Well, there again, we have strong historical support. This is from Tacitus, whom many have regarded as the greatest of Roman historians. And he says, Christos, the founder of the name, was put to death by Pontius Pilate, procurator of Judea, in the reign of Tiberius. Now here he doesn't specifically say crucifixion, but clearly he identifies Christ and he also puts some historical context around it. Here we have um, that he was put to death by Pontius Pilate, procurator of Judea in the reign of Tiberius. So very specific historical information that we can place. Sometimes though, some strong evidence we can get is actually from critics. And there was an interesting character by the name of Lucian of Samosata. And he was a Greek satirist and he particularly targeted Christians and enjoyed making fun of them. And note some of the words that he said or wrote. The poor wretches have convinced themselves that they are going to be immortal and live for all time, in consequence of which they despise death and even willingly give themselves into custody. Furthermore, their first lawgiver persuaded them that they were all brothers of one another by worshipping that crucified sophist himself and living under his laws. Um, so there, very clearly, the idea of crucifixion coming through. But then we look at Josephus, um, who said, when Pilate, upon hearing him accused by men of the highest standing amongst us, had him condemned to be crucified. So as we look at the evidence historically, there's no question that Jesus Christ was a person of history and also that he died by crucifixion. Now, you may have heard of some theories, and occasionally you'll get different theories around Easter time, particularly each year, where people come up with various alternative explanations of what might have happened uh, with Jesus um, around the time of his death. One of the popular ones that you'll hear, and many of you no doubt have heard, is the idea that Jesus didn't actually die. So the thought is, well, look, if he didn't actually die, then he could have then um, appeared to his disciples afterwards and people would have thought that maybe he was resurrected, but he didn't really die. Is this something that is a serious possibility? Well, first of all, we know that those who were crucified were often beaten. And we know that the beating that Jesus suffered was actually quite a significant one. Um, it wasn't just superficial, but it actually tore flesh. It wasn't just the skin, but it went deep down into the tissue and even down into the muscle. So there was a significant beating, and we know he wasn't even strong enough to carry his own cross to the side of crucifixion. So he's certainly weakened by it, by um, the beating, by the pain, by the blood loss. Then we know that crucifixion involved driving of nails through the hands, through the feet, and um, they didn't worry too much about um, um, disinfectants and aseptic technique, as um, you know, I guess we understand today. That wasn't the issue. So what we know is that very quickly there would have been infection set in, and uh, septicemia ultimately, if someone survived long enough, would be something that would be a real medical concern. But what's more, we note in Jesus' case that the Roman soldiers did not break his legs because they already knew that he was dead. They investigated, they had a look, and they found out that he wasn't actually dead. So there was no need to break his legs. What's more, the record is there that there was a spear that was pushed into his side and there was blood and water which came out. 
which indicates that most probably it pierced the heart and the pericardial sac and there was that blood and water which came out, which very certainly would indicate death. Now, some people ask the question, well, was it possible that someone could come down from a cross and actually survive? There is one instance recorded in ancient history, and that was Josephus, recorded the fact that there was someone who was actually on a cross, and they were given a last-minute pardon, reprieve, and they were taken down from the cross while they were still alive. But as Josephus records, well, the person died. And that is hardly surprising from what we understand now about um, medical science. So if there's people who are suggesting that Jesus could have somehow survived the process of crucifixion, then it's not something that can stack up in reality. So this is the first historical point that indeed Jesus was a real person of history and he died by crucifixion. The second historical point, and that is that Christianity grew rapidly despite persecution and being countercultural. Now, what's this countercultural business? Well, first of all, we know that crucifixion was reserved for the worst of the worst. It's not great PR to suddenly try to start a religion that spreads throughout the empire, empire saying the guy who actually started it was crucified. That would raise enormous prejudice and objection. Um, and in fact, the New Testament records the fact that the cross itself was a shame, the shame of the cross. Certainly not something that people would have been attracted to. It was something that would have repulsed people. The second thing is that the whole idea of resurrection was foreign to the whole mindset and understanding of any ancient civilization. There was no civilization, and certainly within the Roman Empire, there was no group that understood that resurrection was something that was possible or indeed something that you would even consider. And so that was another major issue that was at cross purposes with all the cultural understanding of the time. Now, it's not then that there was just a general idea going out there and people were trying to convince in, in a neutral marketplace of ideas. There was persecution, and you can see there the picture of the Colosseum where many Christians died. It wasn't easy being a Christian in the early times in the Roman Empire. Why? Because there were many people who were opposed to the idea of Christianity. So anyone who became a Christian really had better believe and understand why they believed because otherwise it was putting themselves at risk for, for, for what purpose? You really had to know that you believed and were confident in your belief. And the interesting thing is, despite the situation, Christianity grew rapidly. And it wasn't because it had a sword, it wasn't because it coerced or forced. Somehow from a ground roots swell, it grew massively into the thousands, into the hundreds of thousands, and ultimately into the millions. And now, of course, there are two billion people across the world who would at least take on the label of Christian. So this is a second fact that needs to be explained. How was this possible? And here I think you can get a hint that there must have been something extraordinary, there must have been something spectacular that happened that enabled this to happen in such a, an environment that was not at all fertile for the development of Christianity. The next point is, the third one is, that the writers of the New Testament believed that Jesus rose from the dead and they acted on that belief. There's no question they believed it. When you look at um, the, the writings of the New Testament, um, whether you accept it genuinely happened or didn't genuinely happen, what cannot be questioned is that the people who wrote it believed that Jesus had risen from the dead. And we have corroboration outside of the New Testament as well, where there are many writings of church historians, early church fathers, as well as others, that speak about the faith of the early Christians, of the disciples, and the fact that they believed that he rose from the dead. But it wasn't just some academic belief. This was something that made a difference in their lives. They were transformed. They preached. They preached powerfully. They did it despite persecution. They did it despite suffering. And they did it despite the fact that many of them, the majority of them, actually died for their faith. And so the question is, why would somebody die for a lie? What makes it even more um, impossible is that the disciples, when you look at their writings, espouse the highest of ethics, the highest of principles, 
the same as Jesus himself did. This was a radical view of how people should treat each other, that people should love each other, that they should be kind and honest. It would make no sense that the disciples then would knowingly tell a lie and then be willing to suffer for it and die for it. So that's another historical fact that we need to consider. But then there's a fourth one, which I think is highly significant, and that is that the tomb was empty. Now, this is one where there's not universal agreement among scholars. Um, there was um, an academic by the name of Habermas. Um, he conducted a study um, some years ago where he looked at the range of scholarly literature on the, uh, among scholars who looked at um, this topic, and he found that the majority, probably about 75% of them, that is believers and also skeptics, they accepted the fact that the tomb was empty. So certainly a very strong majority. The question is, what is it about the tomb that is so significant, or the empty tomb? And that is this, we, we noted in the reading before from Matthew 28, that the tomb certainly was empty, but there was a story which was circulated by the authorities to come up with some kind of other reason for how it could be empty. And that was that the disciples came and stole the body. You remember what happened? There was some event happened, the tomb was empty, the soldiers, they ran away and they reported to the authorities what happened. But the authorities said, well, hang on a minute. This is not something we, we need to get out there. Here, we will give you money to, for you guys to say that the disciples came and stole the body while you were asleep. And if there was any problem with that, then they would fix it up with the governor, with, with the authorities. Now, can you see here that there's, first of all, there's, there, there, there's a problem. And that is, if you're asleep, how do you know what happened? So if you've got the idea that the, the uh, um, uh, soldiers there, they'd gone to sleep, how can they report that the disciples came and stole the bodies while they're asleep? They're asleep. But what makes it even more amazing is that why would the disciples even want to come and steal the body? First of all, when Jesus died, even before he died, um, many of them ran away. Peter denied Jesus three times. Then, when <laughs> they were there at the time when Jesus um, uh, was in the tomb, they were cowards. They ran away to the upper room and they didn't understand. You'd think that after three and a half years they'd understand, but they didn't understand. They didn't get the fact that Jesus was going to rise from the dead. In fact, they were there scared. They weren't in a frame of mind where they were going to take on the might of the Roman Empire. How? Well, we know that there was a seal placed on the tomb. Now, you don't go around breaking seals just because you think it's a good idea to do that one afternoon. No, breaking a Roman seal was punishable by death. The next thing is there's a stone in front of the tomb. Weighs about two ton. Big stone. So. If you've got some guards there sleeping, let's say, for example, they were sleeping, um, if you have some people go along and try to move away a two-ton stone, do you think it might make some noise? I think it'd make a lot of noise. So the guards, even if they were asleep, aren't going to continue sleeping. So this is the next point. We've got a guard there. Now, a typical guard would have been four soldiers. We know that the guard was doubled or strengthened. And so we would assume there's eight soldiers there. What's the possibility? Well, look, okay, even if one of them went to sleep, you would think that the others would be awake. What are the odds of eight soldiers going to sleep all at the same time? Again, it doesn't add up, particularly when you consider that for Roman soldiers, the punishment of either going to sleep at the post or deserting the post was death. And if somebody had, had, it, um, it, had, had um, how should I say, done something incorrectly, if there had been a crime committed in terms of the, the, the protocol of the soldiers, so if someone had gone to sleep or if someone had deserted the post, if there were, it was unclear who had done that, then lots were drawn because the punishment still had to be given out. It wasn't something that Roman soldiers did. They weren't feared throughout the whole empire because they went to sleep at the post. It's not something that they did. So here we have the difficulty. But then the difficulties go even further, and that is that whoever wrote the, um, uh, the, the Gospels, and we would understand uh, the, the, the authors, but 
The thing is, the writers of the Gospels put women as the first witnesses of the empty tomb. Now, you just didn't do that. You weren't going to do that if you're going to fabricate the story. Why is that? Because in Jewish law, women were not regarded as valid, uh, being able to be valid witnesses in a court of law. It would make no sense to put women as the first witnesses of the empty tomb if you were all trying to fabricate a story. So this detail suggests indeed that it's authentic much more than it's not authentic. But then we have um, the next issue. We have within the New Testament itself the story how Thomas doubted. You remember how Jesus appeared to the apostles, uh, to the ten of them, uh, minus, minus Judas and, and, and minus um, Thomas, and um, then later they told Thomas about it. And Thomas said, no, look, I'm not going to believe it at all. Until I see him, until I touch him, I'm not going to believe. And sure enough, a week later, Jesus and Thomas, they met and Thomas believed. Why? Because he had seen the risen Christ. There's another fact as well, which I think is highly significant, and that is that there was preaching of the resurrection just a few weeks later. And where was it? Was it somewhere in Athens? Was it somewhere in, in Rome? Was it somewhere where nobody had heard of these things? <laughs> no, it was right there in Jerusalem. Right there where these events had happened. The empty tomb was preached, the resurrection of Jesus was preached, and what happened? Thousands of people became believers in Jesus Christ. Now, that wouldn't make any sense if the resurrection hadn't occurred. If there was a tomb there that wasn't empty, all the authorities would need to do would say, hang on, here's the tomb, here's the body exposed. The question is, who saw Jesus alive after he was resurrected? And you can see here there are, many there, there are many people. So first of all, on the Sunday morning, there was Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. Uh, then there were the other women. Then there was Cleopas and his friend. Uh, Sunday afternoon, uh, there was Simon Peter and the 10 apostles without Thomas. Uh, the next Sunday afternoon, 11 apostles with Thomas. Then later, there was the seven by the lake of Tiberias. Then there was more than 500 believers uh, then there were 11 apostles at the ascension into heaven. And then in vision, there was a Saul who became Paul. Now, he's an interesting character because he was actively trying to destroy the early Christian church. He was violently opposed to it. And he had an experience which totally transformed him. There was clearly something that happened to him that was supernatural. So we can see here that there's a record of many people who saw Jesus alive after he was resurrected. But one of them I want to just spend a bit of time on is the one in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance. Now, this is the Apostle Paul speaking. That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the Twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. Now, did you get that bit in the middle, where it says, after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep? What's the apostle Paul basically saying here? He's saying, look, if you don't believe me, there are hundreds of other people who are out there who can tell you about Jesus Christ, the fact that they saw him after he rose from the dead. Now, we know that 1 Corinthians was written approximately AD 50. So what's that? Approximately 20 years or so after these events were written. So it makes perfect sense that if he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers, interestingly, yeah, at that time, then 20 years later, many of those would still be alive. And in fact, what he's saying here is that most of them are still living. So that means well in excess of 250 people were alive, even then, who were witnesses of the risen Christ. Now, does that give us some hints, I think, as to why the Christian faith grew so rapidly? You've got Jesus Christ who died but then you have the apostles who are preaching that he lived, but it's not just the apostles. Imagine that. If there's hundreds of people who have seen him, 
They're going to tell other people who will tell other people and it will spread like wildfire, which is one reason I think it makes perfect sense that just a few weeks after these events, they preached there in Jerusalem and there were thousands of people who accepted Jesus Christ. And then as those people scatter throughout the Roman Empire, then it makes perfect sense that their over time becomes thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of people who then become Christians in an environment which is not conducive to faith and in fact is rather opposed to faith. In fact, the resurrection of Jesus, the idea that he actually rose from the dead is the best interpretation of the historical evidence that we have. And this is a point that J.N.D. Anderson, who is a professor of Ontario Laws at the University of London, he makes this very point. He says a number of different theories, each of which might conceivably be applicable to part of the evidence, but which do not themselves cohere into an intelligible pattern, can provide no alternative to the one interpretation which fits the whole. And then, if that's not a strong statement, there's an even stronger statement um, by Lord Darling, um, who was one of the chief judges in the UK approximately a century ago. And he makes the following observation about evidence, because being in his position, he was able to determine what constituted good evidence and what wasn't such good evidence. And he says the following, the crux of the problem of whether Jesus was or was not what he proclaimed himself to be must surely depend on the truth or otherwise of the resurrection. On that greatest point, we are not merely asked to have faith. In its favour as a living truth, there exists such overwhelming evidence, positive and negative, factual and circumstantial, that no intelligent jury in the world could fail to bring in a verdict that the resurrection story is true. Now, you remember I mentioned um, Frank Morrison um, earlier. Now, Frank Morrison, he did end up writing a book. It was called Who Moved the Stone? Because as he investigated the historical facts surrounding the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he wrote a book. In fact, the first chapter is called The Book That Refused to Be Written. Why is that? Because he delayed, he delayed, because his research was taking him in a different direction to what he anticipated. But he ended up writing the book. Who moved the stone? Now, Josh, also a very interesting character. Um, uh, the person I'm talking about, Josh, is actually Josh McDowell. Uh, you may have heard of him. He wrote the book Evidence That Demands a Verdict. Because he researched the resurrection, he tried to disprove Christianity, and he ended up writing a book. <laughs> he ended up speaking to hundreds, in fact, millions of university students around the world at many hundreds of different campuses. I heard him speak at Macquarie University some, some years ago now. And he became a Christian, he became a believer, and why, when he was asked? He said it was because as he looked at the evidence for the resurrection, he could come to no other conclusion than that Jesus Christ actually rose from the dead. There's another person too, I'll mention, very interesting paper that was presented at a conference just a few years ago in 2010. It was presented by a Dr. Foster, um, who is now Associate Professor Foster um, in the School of Law at the University of Newcastle. And he examined um, the evidence for the resurrection and he looked at um, the statutes, um, so the laws of the state of New South Wales. So he applied the principles of evidence, what was admissible as evidence, what wasn't, what constituted good evidence, what was bad evidence, etc. And he examined that within the framework of today's standards of evidence in the state of New South Wales. And it was interesting, his conclusion to his paper was that when it comes to evidence for the resurrection of Jesus as a historical fact, the evidence is, and he uses the word, compelling. So as we consider the evidence for the resurrection, there's no question that it is exceptionally strong. We can have confidence in the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. So when we look at the Apostle Paul and his challenge, when he says that if Jesus is not risen, your preaching is useless, the faith is futile, well, he can say that with some confidence because he knows that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Well, then, briefly, the question is, well, why does the resurrection of Jesus actually matter? 
And here, I think there's some very strong points why it's significant. Well, clearly already we've discussed the fact that it actually undergirds the whole basis of faith in, in, in Christianity. But there's some very practical other reasons. Romans 10.9. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So the resurrection is pretty well tied up with the fact that um, we're saved. Now, of course, salvation is something that Jesus offers to us as a free gift, whoever will accept. But if there's no resurrection, there's no need for salvation. And there is no salvation, but because Jesus rose from the dead, then we can be saved. We can have confidence in our salvation. The next thing is, and we look at this passage from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We all struggle through situations in life, we suffer. There is evil there. There's temptation. There's difficulty. But we're not on our own. It is only because Jesus has risen from the dead that he is there now able to help us. It says we have a high priest. And it's not that he's unable to empathize with our weakness. He can. And what are we told there? To approach God's throne of grace. What? Not timidly. Not as if we've got to you know, run and hide somewhere. It says to approach with confidence. So that what we may receive mercy and find grace to what help us in our time of need. I mean, that's a really powerful verse that only makes sense in the light of the resurrection. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, by his power, God raised the Lord from the dead and he will raise us also. See, when we consider skepticism when we consider atheism ultimately they don't provide us hope for what happens after we die as i mentioned yesterday the whole idea of relationships and the continuity of relationships is something that we all long for if we lose a loved one if we've lost a loved one Whenever that happens, we always long for the time where we can be reunited. We ask the question, will we ever see that person again? And the good news is, because Jesus has risen from the dead, we too can look forward to our own resurrection and also the resurrection of our loved ones. I mean, this is wonderful news. This is something that can inspire us with hope, with confidence. This is a real reason why faith is just so vital and it makes such a difference in our lives. So when it comes to the resurrection of Jesus, fact or fraud, I think what's very clear is that it is a fact of history. There are various ideas which are out there, but on close examination, they don't stack up. The only, the only way that we can explain the totality of the evidence is that Jesus Christ actually rose from the dead. And because he rose, our lives can be totally transformed. We can look forward to a future which is just amazing and it is fabulous that we can have the confidence that what we believe in is not some sort of blind faith, but it's a faith that is based on a real historical event and a real person and because of that, we can have fabulous hope for the future.